Gubbins, miscellaneous items, paraphernalia. I think I have an above average proclivity for changing my mind about art uh, based on context and information and uh, conscious decisions and philosophy. I think most people, they listen to music and they just think this sounds good or this sounds bad. And I think that's probably a way better way to experience music, right? I think even a lot of people who are into, like, the more experimental music, like, for example, you might listen to... Oh, what... Hmm. What pretentious song am I going to choose for this example? (laughs) Uh, Charles Ives, the unanswered question, right? The most stereotypical one. And you might think, this sounds like shit. But then you will, like, you think about the, the messaging behind it. And then you're like, oh, it, it sounds like that because it's trying to express this particular um, thing, right? Um, and then you can change your mind on it. I think that's kind of common. But I, I, ten, I, I have, okay, so the example I'm going to give is Grimes. So when I heard Grimes is, I think it's her first album, the one that has the, you know that one? Is I don't know. Is I don't know what it's called. It's been a long time since I listened to Grimes, but I listened to that album and it was fucking sick. It was a sick fuck. I loved it, right. And me and look, my friend Lil Crazy Bitch got into the album at the same time, and we both thought it was fucking sick. And then, both of us ended up doing more research into Grimes. It's a weird coincidence that we both came to sort of the same conclusion. But I love that album, right? And then I started, I watched the Nardwa interview, where, and then Grimes was like, I really love pop punk and shit. And I fucking hate pop punk to this day. But it, back then I, I was like a really into the punk scene. And I hated pop punk even more than I hate pop punk now. Um, because it's a perversion of everything punk stands for, right? But now I'm slightly less moralistic about punk. But I still think it sounds like shit. Uh, and I was like, that's a bit sus. And then I listened to like Art Angels the next album, and I found out that the first album was made, like, entirely in GarageBand, and I listened to Art Angel, it's like, oh, so this is what she makes when she actually, like, knows how to produce, and this is, like, what she actually wanted to make, basically. And I hated it. I thought it sounded terrible. And then I sort of went back and thought about the first album, and I thought maybe all the stuff that I thought was, like, clever was actually just her not really know, knowing what she was doing and sort of just just uh, making, like, mistakes. And the intentionality I'd read into it wasn't actually there. Like, maybe it wasn't meant to sound trippy or experimental or, like, left field in that way. Maybe that was just an accident that came from her not really knowing what she was doing. And if uh, she, she doesn't actually, like like those sounds and and then then there's the whole like death of the author thing like well does it matter if she meant to do it if that's how but i can no longer interpret it as this is the artist's vision because i know it's not i know it's just because she didn't know what she was doing and she was making it all in garage band and that's why it sounds like that so i can no longer think like oh this is like a genius move to 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 make a, a synth sound like that or whatever. Like, now I know, like, oh, she, this is a complete fluke. Um, and so now I no longer like the album anywhere near as much. I still think a few of the songs are pretty good. Like, I still enjoy them. Uh, but I definitely would not rate the album as highly as I used to rate it when I before I knew all the stuff about Grimes. Um, and, uh, yeah... And that's why I was mentioning that. Oh, yeah, I remember why I was mentioning it. It's because of hyperpop, because that's what I'm thinking about these days is hyperpop. It lives rent free in my head. Fraxium lives rent free in my head. Sebi lives rent free in my head. I, I think some people can do it well, you know, like not hyperpop, but modern 
I, I wish there was like a more broad term for this sort of music. Maybe like, I don't know, I should invent something. It, it includes, oops, dropped my phone on my chest. But it's more than just hyperpop, it includes like Surge and like Blady type stuff and like uh, whatever the sort of like new trance stuff, like PC music and uh, like the new scene inspired stuff, like Heart Crush or whatever. Like all of that is sort of lumped into this one genre in my head. Uh, I guess you could just call it 2000s hauntology or whatever. Um, yeah. I still like Blady. Like, I love Blady. I still think Blady's great. But I don't think any of you are Blady. <laughs> I think only Blady can do Blady. I think only Echo 2K can do Echo 2K. Um, like... There has even been people, I've seen people in, I saw a tweet, I don't remember who made it, no idea, but I saw a tweet a long time ago from from a hyperpop person I was following, I don't remember who, who said like, stop making Donk House or Donk Trap or whatever, I don't remember what the fuck, only Alice Gas can do it, no one else can do it. Um, now I don't think Alice Gas is particularly good, I don't, I never particularly liked Alice Gas. But that's not the point. The point is there's... I don't know what the point is. The point is I, I used to like it. But now when I listen to 100 Gex, I just feel like... Bruh. <laughs> I just feel like bruh. It kind of feels like listening to Linkin Park, you know? <sighs> no, you don't know. I said you know as if anyone could possibly understand what's, what the weird fucking thoughts. Everything feels artificial to me. Um, there's that one Sophie interview where she talks about, like, everyone values art to be, like, a personal expression and, like, genuine emotion. But what if you're used to, you view music as make the most sparkly poppy thing possible that's also a fun challenge and i agree that it's also a fun challenge but i feel like it's just to me way less valuable than than actually meaningful music personally meaningful music like uh i i i you know i like i like some of the hundred gex songs you know Still to this day, I like some of the hundred gex songs, but none of them are ever gonna mean as much to me as any personal music. None, none, no hundred gex song is ever gonna mean as much to me as "Whiskey Is My Kind of Lullaby" by Pat the Bunny, for example. Uh, like that's physically impossible because they are hidden behind five layers of irony and six layers of nostalgia, and uh, they're not trying to be that. Like, like. That's not their goal. It's it's not really a fault to say, well, you're not making fucking this type... Of, yeah, they're not trying to make that type of music. That, that's fine. You can make whatever type of music you like. I just don't know if I want to make that type of music or listen to that type of music anymore. And I already talked about this for like an hour at the end of the last video. Um, so I'll, I'll probably start talking about that now. But, you know, it's just been on my mind recently. Um, there are four phases to my rotating sleep cycle this is my voice because i just woke up so um some of you might know i uh damn my voice sounds super cool right now <laughs> um some of you might know that I, I i sort of have a sleep quote unquote problem where basically i every day i don't feel tired until a little bit later than i should right and so if i I'm not uh, forced to, well, even if I am, but basically if I'm freed to sleep whenever I want or whenever I feel tired, then um, I'll just sleep a little bit later every day and then therefore wake up a little bit later every day. And so I slowly rotate throughout the entire 24-hour day. So I'll start by going to bed at like midnight and then 
eventually I'm going to bed at like 5 a.m. And then eventually I'm going to bed at 10 a.m. And then eventually I'm going to bed at 12 and then 1 p.m. And then, you know, it rotates all the way around. And so right now I'm in the phase, which may be my favorite phase, but I, it's maybe my second favorite phase. There's four phases, but this, this is the phase where you wake up in the very early morning. So like 3 a.m. Uh, it's, it's about 3 a.m. when I woke up. Um, and, uh, that's quite a nice, surreal feeling. Uh, there's four phases. So there's, there's the, um, awake during the daytime fully while I'm going to bed, you know, maybe somewhere around from 10, maybe let's say anywhere between 8 PM and midnight. Then there's going to bed late at night where I'm, you know, going to bed, I'm, I'm awake throughout the night, but that's, so maybe I'll sleep, uh, at somewhere around, like, from 3 to 5 a.m. Actually, let's move that up to 3 to 8 a.m. Uh, then there's, uh, f like, fully nocturnal, where I, I go to sleep in what can only be described as the day, like, the, the, the morning, so I'm, a, the time I'm awake, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. You know what I'm trying to say here. You, you understand. But uh, this is an interesting one. I feel like most people, because a lot of like neat or interesting people stay up late, right? They they get to experience the nighttime, but they always get to experience it when it's nighttime when you're about to go to sleep. But experiencing the nighttime when you just woke up is also a very interesting experience. It's a very nice, it's quite a nice feeling. Then you wake up and you you go outside, you go out into the front room to make breakfast and it's dark out and everything's nice and quiet. It's very peaceful. It's a little surreal though. Like you can you can kind of feel that your body clock is kind of freaking out a little bit. Like like you can kind of feel inside that like hmm, something in my brain isn't meant to do this. But uh it it does feel quite nice to do it. I'm not sure if you saw that in the previous clip, but uh there's a there's a jar of peanut butter over there, and uh, I don't want anyone thinking that I've stooped so low that I'm just have a jar of peanut butter in my room that I'm just scooping peanut butter out of. You know, even I, even I have some self respect in that regard. It's in here because my mom will do that. My, if I if it's in the front room, my mom will just occasionally go to the cupboard and just scoop a bit out with a spoon and just eat it and so she put it in here to, so that she won't do that um she put it with me for safekeeping so i am the keeper of peanut butter and one of my favorite youtube channels a guy called uh dave ball he's a japanese well he's not japanese but he his his style of video is japanese woodblock carving you might know him he had a viral ish video with like asmr unintentional asmr remembering a carver very very good youtube channel definitely recommend checking it out but because of that channel i started actually genuinely unironically getting into ukiyo-e uh prints like i i sometimes very not that often but i have a few times like just spent an evening just looking at woodblock prints on the internet because they're fucking sick and uh i actually bought this t-shirt from, from uniqlo so it's an FA approved, FA approved brand, right? Uh, Hokusai, famous woodblock printmaker. Looks really nice. The fabric's really good. Very happy with it. Yeah, and it looks kind of like a um, <laughs> like this bit. Kind of looks like a like a bash like fetch script. <laughs> Like, I don't know, this bit, look, like, I mean, I've shown you this already, but why does Super Enter have to be on the opposite side of the fucking, like, this bit? <laughs> I don't know why. This is how fucking retarded I am, but that bit kind of reminds me of it. But anyway, yeah, it looks good. Did I get a ThinkPad because of Luke Smith? No, I had a ThinkPad years before I knew who Luke Smith was. I got a ThinkPad because of doing my own research about Linux and computing in general. FL works on Ryan. I do that. I'm sure it does. I fucking hate FL. I will never use it. It's a piece of shit. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine for people who grew up using it and spent years learning it. But to me, it's the most unintuitive piece of shit software I've ever fucking used, and it's so fucking frustrating that I will never use it. Might surprise you. 
I don't use Serum or Massive or anything like that. I don't. I, I, I used to use Massive back in the day, but I don't use it anymore. I don't have it on my computer anymore. I just use stock Logic plugins, Alchemy, Sampler, ES2, ES3, ESP. All of the stock Logic plugins, basically. I don't. I don't use any of the other synths, like not st non-stock synths, and that might be surprising. But I'm gonna be honest. Firstly, Alchemy is insanely powerful. <laughs> Like, that's a fucking great uh, software. But uh, I don't think there's ever been a time when I've wanted to make a sound and I felt like I couldn't because of the software. Almost always it's because of my skill that I can't make a sound. Like, I feel like I could do it if I knew how to manipulate the synth properly. And uh, if there is a time when I am limited by the synth I'm using, then... Um, you know, I can always go in and bounce it and manipulate the audio instead. And then I can pretty much always get something that I want. The sound that I'm imagining in my head. There's no, there's, it's very rare that, I mean, I think most of the reason people use these synths is just for inspiration. Like, because you have, the, the workflow is different and the options are different. So you get different inspiration from it. Um, which is perfectly cool. But that's that's a cool way to do it. But I don't think you need it. Like, do you know how fucking crazy the stock FM synth is in Logic? Not even the retro synth one. The one that's the FM1 or whatever it's called. Like, that's just crazy. It's so basic, but you can guess so much out of it. People were using very basic synths for a really long time before there were crazy... Uh, VSTs were like a thing, and some of the music's so good. You don't, you don't. It might take a lot more effort, but I don't think you need any of it. Maybe I should. I mean, I don't know. I don't even know why I started recording. At the end of my UK music video thing, I go on a bit of a rant about UK drill, and I think I was a bit overly harsh. Um, <coughs> You know, I I don't hate the music, I just don't think it's anywhere near as interesting as Grime. And there's two reasons for that. Firstly, Grime is a culmination of a billion different musical lineages. From dub, dancehall, raga, bashment, uh, garage, two-step, jungle even, uh, UK funky, bit of house, bit of techno sometimes... And, uh, you know, emceeing, as in, like, hosting-type emceeing, uh, like, DJ-type emceeing uh, that you would see at a club night, and, you know, pirate radio culture, and all of that, and American hip-hop, right? But UK Drill is just influenced by American hip-hop and then a little bit of the lineage of grime, like... Sometimes in the synths you will hear, and in the tempos a little bit, they tend to be faster. That's sort of it. Like the it's it's sort of you know. Do you know? Does that make sense? Like it's it's way less. The the musical lineage is just way less involved and interesting to me, and it's way more focused on just focusing on the American influence, rather than this cultural mishmash that I think defines, has always defined UK music to, to me, all the best UK music, because, um, you know, the UK is such a mixing pot of cultures, as they say. <coughs> um, and the second thing is that grime sounds like music from the future, even to this day. You listen to some of them old Wiley instrumentals and stuff like that, listen to Boy in the Corner, you listen to, you know, all of this shit, um, and it sounds like this, it sounds like futuristic. It sounds like future music, you know. It sounds like almost cyberpunk in a way, uh, or it, it, yeah, it it sounds like music from the future. It's forward looking. I can't think of any other way to put it. Um, uh, it it sounds like someone who is, you know, looking beyond the horizons. It sounds like something that was literally. It doesn't sound like something that that grew from the past. It sounds like something that arrived from the future. Does that make sense? Whereas UK Drill sounds like today. It sounds like now. It doesn't sound like the future. It sounds like the present. Um, 
and yeah, that's just not as interesting to me. <clears throat> you know, like Code Nine, for example, and Mark Fisher both loved grime and dubstep in the you know old days, and they they both wrote about it and they both um, you know liked it, and they were like philosophers you know mark fisher obviously pretty famous uh code nine has a phd in philosophy wrote a book i haven't read it <coughs> um there's no way they would ever do that with the uk drill because it doesn't sound like there's nothing to write about it from a philosophical standpoint there is you could but it's nowhere near as interesting um in terms of that sort of viewpoint from a, a sort of arriving from the future viewpoint um yeah it's accelerated music does that make sense i'm back at uni in my zoom course this motherfucker got a jojo's background if you want to know the sort of people i go to uni with um they're all sitting there reminiscing about the first two years of uni before Rona. Right. And it was like, they were talking about all this stuff, like all the people they know and all the things that happened. The whole time I was just withdrawn inwards. I don't, I don't know half these people's names. I don't know, most, I think, the only reason I know their names is when they flash up on the Zoom thing. Um, they're talking about being in the student accommodation, getting up to all cyber shit, talking to people, going between classes, having all sorts of experiences and friendships and playing shows and going to shows and working on music and shit because I'm studying music, if you didn't know. I, I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't talk to a single person. I talked to one person maybe once a day at uni. And I remember this isn't like, I only go in three days a week, so that was it. And that was just because I knew her, because we went to the same school. We'd maybe have a short conversation after class because we went to the same direction, different bus stops, to go home. She invited me out to, like, a, to come over and smoke weed with her or whatever. But I said no. That happened once, but yeah. Um, it's crazy how much I changed. Back in first year of... Um, not first year, one of the first few years of secondary school. Um, I don't remember why, but there was some sort of poll in some class where everyone was going, everyone would get up in front of the room and then the class would vote on whether they thought that person was introverted or extroverted. And every, every other person, there was some sort of debate. And when I got up, every single person said extrovert. Everyone. Because I was just, I didn't know how to control what I said, so I just spoke all the time. Okay? I didn't know, I didn't have any filter, I didn't think before I did things. Um, and how did I change so much from then to now, when... Some of these people I've never had a conversation with in my life, don't even know their names, despite going to school with them for three years. And it's not a big class, it's not like, oh, well, there's, there's 50 people, no, it's, there's 12 <laughs> in this lesson right now. I think I've talked to one of them. Once. It was a choice, somewhat, like... It's not like I'm out here wishing I was hanging out with these people or whatever. Like, they're, they're fine people, it's nothing against them, but it's just hard for me to keep track of too many friendships. Um, uh, yeah. It's 
it's mad. It's a mad one. I've been watching so much grime videos that I've started talking more and more British. Because <laughs> I'm just deep diving grime. And I'm reincorporating all the British slang. It's a mad one. Alright, this might count, sound kind of silly. But I have some thoughts about intelligence. Don't worry, I'm not going... There's no, I'm not going on the IQ thing. Um... I think society, our society, our world, maybe values intelligence a little too much. Like, you think of, like, House, right, the character from the TV show, and it's like, House is a dickhead to everyone. No one likes him. He's literally a bad person. But he's really smart, and he's always right. And so, you're kind of meant to, like agree with your, your mentors rally behind him and I do like when I watch house like I think he's a cool character but that's just because I'm socialized in a, a world that values intelligence over everything else like if I was actually in a room with house as a real person if I knew someone like that like I'd think they were a piece of shit you know someone who treats people like that and whatever just because they're right all the time doesn't just because they're smarter than you like, I don't know if we should value that as much as we do. I feel like there are other things that, that might be more important, like, uh, I don't know, not being a fucking arsehole. Um, I also think that the way we think about intelligence is a little silly. Um, it, it tends to be about what you know. But I have a, a theory, maybe this is, this is maybe, um, a little bit ancient Greek, who was it, was it Plato that said it, that like, I'm the smartest man in Athens because at least I know that I don't know anything, something like that, it's a little bit like that, and then maybe intelligence is more about not what you know, but what you know that you don't know, like, the more you find out about things, the more you become aware of how much you're not aware of stuff about that thing. Um, maybe this is what it means to move towards a greater unknowing. So, for example, um, if you lived in a room, if you if you lived in a a very simple, basic civilization, basic, not civilization, but like society, a, ba a very basic society, like a, let's say, for example, I, I, basic is not really the right word here, but I'll just use it anyway. For example, let's say you live in some sort of Amazonian tribal community, and you, you know, there's maybe 50 people or less in your tribe, and you know all of them, you've known them your whole life, and you're hunter-gatherers, and, you know, generally, your world is quite small. And you might think that you know most of the things that you, that you, uh, that are knowable. Or a lot of the things that are knowable. Because your experience of the stuff in the world is quite small. And compare that to, um, someone, uh, so you might... You might believe that your world, or maybe as a child, that's actually probably a better analogy. As a child, you might believe that you, you, that there aren't, knowing all the things that it's possible to know is not too far away from your grasp. That's why teenagers tend to be really overconfident and smart asses because they sort of think, they, they, this, they've come to understand all of the things that they think they need to understand from the small world that a child experiences. But then once you grow up, you realize the scope of things is much larger than you imagined. And now you realize, oh, I actually feel like I know less than I knew back then because I didn't know that these were things that I could know. And then maybe if you specialize in a certain subject or you as you you learn more about the world you learn there's more and more things that you don't know um for example you could i don't know i'll pick something that i i could i could pick a specialism of mine let's say um uh i don't know 
but I'm struggling to pick between music and anime. Let's go anime now and I'll use music in a second. So let's say you start getting really into anime and at first you're like, oh, well, I need to watch Cowboy Bebop and Attack on Titan and Kill la Kill and blah, blah, blah. But then as you go further in, you're like, oh, anime, there's, there's, oh, well, now if I want to watch all the good stuff, I should watch Rose of Versailles <laughs> or... Oh, I should deep dive this particular director, and oh, this character designer worked on visual novels before. Let me read some visual novel. Oh, this anime is based on this manga, and that manga, so suddenly, you're exposed to a wider world. That Maybe that wasn't the best example. But also, like, intelligence itself is a strange concept. Like, what what's the difference between intelligence and ability? What's the gap there? For example... I would cons- I would say that the thing I'm best at in the world is making music. That's the thing I've spent the most time practicing doing. It's what I hope to make my career. It's, I, as far as I know, a few at least a few people seem to think I'm pretty good at it as well. I'm not trying to say I'm the best musician in the world or anything, but I'm saying I'm relatively confident in my ability to make music. You know, I have uh, knowledge of various uh, v- uh, VSTs and synths, and even if I don't have that knowledge, my knowledge of the mechanics of synthesis allow me to create sounds um, with something I've never seen before, uh, just by knowing how synthesis works, basically. Or I am relatively good at composition. I can I have a good ear for composition, so like I can hear a song here. If I want to learn how to make a genre, I can I can listen to some songs in that genre and um, identify key elements and that that would that uh key signifiers, and then reproduce that genre when I need to. Stuff like that. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not trying to say... I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to sit here saying I'm, I'm a genius or anything, but I'm relatively good at making music, right? And I know a lot of things about making music, and I am mechanically skilled at making music. Not the most in the world, but I'd say pretty much. Like, enough. I can get by, right? Does that make me smart? Is that intelligence? Is my ability to make a, a massive patch from scratch or whatever that sounds how I want it to sound. Intelligence or craftsmanship or what? We don't have a good measure for that sort of thing in our our, our, our language or our, our world. Like, um, artistic intelligence, I guess. And even beyond that, say... You're a craftsman, you make, you're a carpenter, let's say, and, uh, are you intelligent for being very good at carpentry? Yes, like, I would say yes, but it's not the same kind of intelligence we normally mean when we say intelligence. Or, for example... Um, if you're, uh, a really high scoring student, like a PhD or something, right? But you, um, you're not very good at, you're, you're kind of autistic and not very good at social skills or whatever. You can't really network with people. You get nervous around the, the, the people you're attracted to or whatever. I almost said the opposite sex, but that would have been heteronormativity, and we don't don't support that here on the No Thank You channel. We support the gays. Um, well, then you're intelligent in one way, but you're not intelligent in another way, because social skills are a form of intelligence, right? You, you need to have knowledge and ability, blah, blah, blah. So it's like, I, I, the whole concept of intelligence, the way it is in it, in our world, is just a bit ridiculous. I think the more you know that you don't know, it can make you feel dumber, but that's actually getting smarter, I think. That's basically my conclusion here. That like so what I said before, deep diving like, oh I'm I'm super I'm probably know the most about music, but uh, making music. Well, I know now that there's so much stuff I don't know about 
music. My there are so many different fields that, that could be deep dived into. You could deep dive into sound psychoacoustics, um, music theory. Even within music theory, there are many different branches. Classical music theory, uh, jazz music theory. Um, the different instrument specific theory like drums uh, versus violin for example or um, uh, d- d- uh, other cultures uh, ethnomusicology so you know microtonal tuning systems there are so many things and that's just in one tiny area and I don't know anything about any of those or like uh, synthesis oh I said oh I'm pretty good at synthesis I understand how that works no I do not I do not compare to people who actually understand synthesis like there are so many paths to go down there. You've got from analog synths, modular synths, to making your own VSTs, Max for Live, um, FM synthesis, uh, all these weird types of synthesis like um, physical modeling, um, uh, additive synthesis. Uh, um, what's that shit called? There's all type of fucking weird different things. Or, or when it comes to uh, mixing and mastering, there are people who spend their whole careers just mixing things. Like, that's their job. And they are way better at it than me. Even compression. There are compression engineers who all they do is uh, compressors. Um, there's, like, uh, mastering. I don't know anything about mastering. There are ma- people whose entire job is mastering, you know? Um there's there's so much stuff. There's people who make music programs, who program the the VSTs and the DAWs and whatever tools you need. There are people who build physical things like build amplifiers and build guitar pedals. There are people who are super into like guitar pedals and stuff like that. There are like that's a whole thing that I don't know anything about. Like being really into know, knowing all the stuff about gear, like knowing all the different amps and microphones and knowing all the different makes of guitars and all see how much stuff I can name that I don't know there's so much stuff I don't know I didn't even know if but when I knew less about music I wouldn't have known all these things that I don't know about so I think that might be what it means to be to get smarter is to know more things that you don't know about because every time you learn something new it's like bringing up new questions about the world I hope that makes sense um spooks right there's it's not impossible to uh cliche but deprogram yourself it take just takes a lot of time like the way i see it most apparent in my own experience is in terms of masculinity and uh stuff like that feminist shit, you know, like I, yeah, there, there, there's example. like when I'm like, oh, I, I catch myself thinking about certain things that I, I can't do, and then I realise, like, why do I think that's a bad thing to do, why do I think that's cringe or whatever, and I realise, oh, it's because it's like, not masculine, or like, oh, it's associated with gay people, or being being feminine, being gay, being weak, like, perceived as weak, and I'm like, oh, well, that's fucking stupid, you know, but I, like, it's still, ha- it's not, it doesn't happen in a day where you're like, oh, uh, masculinity is, is, has problems, <laughs> uh, easy, like, no, it's a bunch of internal change that happens over time, um, there's definitely, I mean, there's examples, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is that you can sort of work your way out of these spooks in your head. You you can. It might never happen 100% in your whole lifetime, but you can step-by-step step work on it, you know, like, you can, uh, you can just notice things, that's, I think that's how everything starts, is just by noticing things, like, uh, yeah, like, when I, re- when I realized, I was thinking back, here, you know what, example, fine, this isn't really a serious one, this is just an obvious one, 
So I was thinking back about my childhood and my little brother and stuff. And my little brother, when he was young, was really into Justin Bieber, as a lot of young kids are, right? He really liked Baby, the song. He was very young, like, and I was a dick about it. I think most people don't even realise I have a little brother, but yeah. <laughs> um, and I was like, you can't like Justin Bieber. And and I thought more about, like, how... So then recently I looked back and I was like, everyone really hated Justin Bieber. Like, to an irrational degree, they really, really hated Justin Bieber. And the music's shit, right? But there's loads of terrible music. Like, I there's so much terrible music in the world. I, people hate... Like, I would say some of the Katy Perry songs are just as bad as some of the Justin Bieber songs, you know? Like, there's there's loads of awful pop music. Why did the world latch on to Justin Bieber so much? Why did I latch on to Justin Bieber so much? It's like... And on the one hand, it's like, oh, there's a, justifi- there's a justifiable reason because he, he, his music represents the most sort of awful uh, commercialised pop music possible, you know? Like, the most... Uh, just bland, milk toast, awful, plastic expression of corporate pop music, right? That's that's true. But on the but it's also, and you can say this about One Direction as well. Oh well, men aren't supposed to like boy band type music, you know. That's gay. That's a that's a girly thing to like. Like oh, Justin Bieber, he's a he's a boy, but he sings girly songs. It's like oh, that's that's gay. That's bad. This isn't me coming out as a Justin Bieber fan. I still think his music's shit. Even his later stuff that other people seem to like, like the Jack Yu stuff. I still think that's bad as well. All pop music is shit. But the point is that. Why the fuck did I get so upset over my brother liking dumb pop music? When I was his age, I was really into a boy band (laughs) called McFly. I don't know if they were ever big outside of the UK. But, um... And they were a bit more... They sort of found themselves like a pop rock. So, like, they each played instruments. It it wasn't like... It wasn't just singing. But, uh... Like, when you listen to the music, it's literally the worst possible boy band music. I think it's just a thing that kids like. And I think it's marketed that way as well. I think it's designed to be a thing that kids like. I don't know. That's just an example. You know, it's like, oh, that was kind of a weird fucking thing to do. Like, maybe if I wasn't programmed in a certain way by... Maybe if I wasn't socialised in a certain way then I wouldn't have had such a weird obsession with that sort of thing. Because it was an obsession on the internet. Justin Bieber hate. Same with Twilight hate. And it's always things that teenage girls like. And many people have pointed this out. And the point isn't that those things are good. I mean, I I never really got got into Twilight hate. I I never really cared about it. Um, Hating on Twilight. Now, Now, this is the thing, right? Is that that's a thing? But it's not just things that girls like, or not just things that uh, are seen as feminine, right? It's also things that are seen as, like, uh, I don't know. I Like, I think... I haven't really figured it all out yet. But there's weird stuff going on in the world. There's weird stuff. And there's just no reason to let it affect you, you know? It's hard to not do it, though. But I I think you can just... It's all about noticing it. It's all about questioning all of your thought patterns. That's why I always get so obsessed with, oh, you have to know why you do things. That's... This is why. Because you have to notice the things you're thinking. You have to in order to improve yourself and in order to improve the world in order to live a more satisfying existence, I guess. Because if you're not questioning that sort of shit, you're just a normie. Like, that's how you end up with the sort of people who 
you know, just listen to pop music and go to clubs and drink whatever they're told to drink, as they say. I don't know if anyone says that, as I say. <laughs> uh, yeah, you got to notice these things. So yesterday, a man came to fix my internet, right? My shit's been broken, I don't know if I mentioned it, but basically... Every so often, maybe every few minutes, basically, it just cuts off completely. Um, but only for like 30 seconds, and then it comes back. It varies. Sometimes it will go off for a longer time, but normally, like, a, it basically shuts off for a little bit and then comes back. Or it doesn't entirely... It's, it's like, hard to tell what's going on. But I, I think it either completely shuts off or it just gets incredibly, incredibly slow to the point where it may as well have shut off. And, um, normally this didn't actually affect me, which is interesting, because, like, unless you're trying to load a web page at the exact moment that the internet shuts off, um, you never notice it, because, like, for example, online video streaming, it has, bu- it buffers, so you, even if the internet goes down for 30 seconds, you probably have 30 seconds of buffer, and so you never notice it. And yeah, so it was mostly not even noticeable when I was browsing. The only time it was really bad is when I was playing CSGO. Because in CSGO, you have to, it's obviously a constant stream of data. There's no buffering. That doesn't make any sense. So every few minutes or whatever, I'm getting kicked from matches, disconnecting, have to reconnect. Somehow, I managed to never get kicked at the end of a match and not be able to you know, have to abandon the match and get a short ban. Somehow I always managed to reconnect before the end of the match, which was fortunate for me. But, yeah, it was very annoying. It made CSGO unplayable for a while. But now it seems like it's fixed, um, which will be good. Maybe I can play CSGO again. But in the meantime, I downloaded another game. Called Sengoku Dance which I'll probably end up talking about more in this video. Does anyone else kind of feel like they've been through a war when they wake up? Like, when I wake up, it's just like... It's like it's like I've been sucked up by a hurricane or trapped in a desert for 12 years. You know, it's... Here's what, the, what I'm going through when I wake up. So I wake up. Firstly, obviously, you're fucking tired and you feel like shit because you've been asleep, right? You don't really know what's going on. You check your phone to see what time it is, and it fucking blinds you because you forgot to turn the brightness down before you went to sleep. So you're blind, permanently, permanent eye damage, right? And then you're fucking so thirsty. I'm I'm always so thirsty when I wake up. I, my mouth is so dry, and I'm, I've probably been biting my tongue while I was asleep or something, so my mouth is fucked, and I'm super thirsty, so I reach over and I, like, pour water into my mouth, but I'm still lying down, so it pours all over my fucking face, and I'm, like, so now I'm, like, wet, <laughs> my, my face is wet, my fucking, my mouth's still dry because you need more than one sip of water to wake you up, I'm tired as fuck, and then I'm all snotty, because I always wake up with a s- snotty as fuck nose, and a phlegm in my throat, loads of phlegm, so I'm, I've got snot fucking drip pouring out my nose, my throat is super dry, but also super phlegmy, so it's like, and I desperately need water, and then I'm like, I need to, I need, I need nicotine, so it's like I'm, I'm craving nicotine, but and then it's just I've got sleep in my eyes I got that shit in your eyes and so my my eyes are all fucked everything's fucked and then I, I, and I'm desperate for a piss I really need to piss but it's like I don't want to take the duvet off because it's cold so I'm like under the duvet like thirsty as fuck but also really need to piss and I don't want to get out of bed because it's fucking freezing so I'm like struggling to find the motivation until I can't hold it anymore and I'm like pouring water all over my face by accident it's just awful it's just terrible and it takes and then I'm, I can't can't do anything so I just I open up my phone I check my notifications of course I don't have any messages or anyone no no one cares about me right so it's like but I'm checking anyway just in the desperate vague hope that someone will have messaged me just to, to get that shot of dope dopamine that I need from my internet addiction and oftentimes I'll, I'll like 
because I don't have the motivation to do anything right now. I just woke up, my brain's half asleep. I'm fucking thirsty as fuck. I'm dying. I can't even bring myself to sit up in bed. I'm, I'm, you know, so all I can do is go on my phone and do the most mindless activity. So normally, what I'll do is I'll check my YouTube subscriptions and be disappointed because it's never anything fucking good. And whatever is good, it's like, oh, I've got one good video to watch today. And it's, you know, because I'm, I'm always hopeful. I'm like, oh, I've been asleep for nine hours or whatever. Like, I hope that's nine hours for someone to have put out an interesting video. And, like, it's always disappointing. I'm like, oh, I'm going to run out of videos in, like, two hours after I wake up. And then I'm just going to end up, like, d- doing some random shit. Or, like, get, blah, blah, blah. it doesn't even make any sense. But yeah, waking up is just like coming home from a war. And then you're like half remembering a dream and it was some weird fucked up dream all the always. Some weird dream. (laughs) I'm just remembering my dream from last night. I barely remember, but it was very odd. It was a very strange dream that I remember. Ah. Yeah, terrible, terrible, terrible experience. I'm not ready to do anything until like three hours after I wake up. I am not ready to do anything. Oh yeah, it's been snowing for the last two days, but uh, it stopped snowing now, so it's kind of mostly melted. But I figured I, I, I kind of forgot to film it, but I think that's something interesting, so here's some snow when I was left. I've been noticing, that's definitely not the correct phrase to start this thought off with. Let's start again. I had a thought, I noticed, you know what, this doesn't need a preface. I can simply get straight into the, the meat of it, straight into the point, without um, qualifiers beforehand, you know? So it, the internet is a platform where it's access to all of human knowledge, right? Instant access to all of human knowledge, um, instant communication, instant... Um, endless storage for whatever you could possibly want to do with it, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, if I am like, I want to learn about, I don't know, some random science thing, I can go and find any number of resources to learn about that science thing. Or, oh, I want to get into an obscure genre of music, I can find an infinite number of resources pertaining to Chilean jazz funk or whatever, you know? So what do people actually use the internet for? There's, there's a common joke, right? Like, oh, you go back to a, a person from the, the Middle Ages and you say, in the future we have uh, a resource which allows, we have technology which allows instant access to all of human knowledge and we use it to look at pictures of cats. You know? That's like the, old, the classic meme. The classic meme moment. But pictures of cats isn't quite broad enough but the internet defaults to mildly funny, mildly humorous, not laugh out loud funny because that's too difficult to do, right? Like it's impossible for the standards to be laugh out loud funny, um, like incredibly hilarious because very rare things actually are that funny. Uh, you know, it's just not possible. And also that sort of funny depends on context. So it's much, you're much more likely to find a, a joke to be funny enough to laugh out loud if you're at a comedy show surrounded by a warmed up crowd, you know, you, you're kind of drunk, you're with your friends, you're in a mood, you know, it depends on the mood, all that sort of stuff. So, but it also doesn't default to like serious informational stuff. That's all, that's all out there, but it's not the vast majority of posts. The vast majority of posts are average people, regular people trying to be just, just a little bit amusing, just, just, oh, little joke. No joke here and there. Oh, it's a little tweet. <laughs> that made me. That made me go. <laughs> oh, this YouTube video. Oh, I'm not rolling on the floor crying my eyes out laughing at it. Those do exist, but they're rare. But it's not like, and you know, sometimes I also watch things that aren't about that. Like here, yeah, autism and imposter syndrome. Gonna watch that soon. Um, right. But 99% of the stuff I watch is simple flips. You know, it's entertaining. And it's just, it's just funny enough. It's just funny enough. And I realized that's not just the internet. That's everything. TV is also like that. Like sitcoms, for example. No sitcoms are regularly loved. Maybe, 
I, I mean, no, no popular comedy TV show or any TV show for that matter is actually that funny. You will notice this if you actually pay attention to watching TV shows. None of them are that funny. Even the really funny ones, like, um, I don't know, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, for example. I think that's widely, regard- widely accepted as a very funny show. I hope so. Otherwise, uh, whatever. I think it's a great show. Even the really funny ones, like Sunny, Always Sunny, right? They're not, they're just mildly funny. Like, they're just, hmm. <laughs> Those wacky guys, you know? But that's everything that's been that way since, like, Seinfeld. It's been that way since pre-Seinfeld. It's been that way forever since the existence of TV. It's been that way since radio. That's what radio is, too. It's just... <laughs> that's what talk shows are. It's what all... Everything defaults to light entertainment. That's what anime is, too. There are very few anime that are laugh-out-loud funny. There may be an anime with an occasional joke that makes you laugh once or twice. There are also not that many anime that are just serious with no jokes. Most anime, when they're not doing plot stuff, when like if if you take an anime, some, there are some times when it's doing plot stuff, right? But it actually spends most of its runtime being mildly funny. Like if you take a shonen, right? Like, uh, I, I, no, I haven't watched that much shonen, but let's say, for example... Hunter Hunter or Dr. Stone that's a more recent example so Dr. Stone right Dr. Stone has the shonen stuff it has the plot it has definite plot beats it has very clear hero's journey stuff right but most of the runtime is just here are these characters doing some light banter making some mildly humorous comments you know oh here's a mildly humorous straight man funny man routine uh, that's what most cute girl Moe shows are as well. Almost none of them are laugh out loud funny, except for Take You, which is maybe not even a cute girl's Moe show. It's almost a parody of a cute girl's Moe show, right? Most of them aren't like that. Take You is not how most anime is, as much as I wish it was. Most Moe shows are uh, young comrade adaptations, right? So you get beep, 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 punchline, beep, 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 punchline, beep, 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 punchline, or sometimes beep, beep, punchline, and then a follow-up. Sometimes the punchline comes on the third panel of a young comrade. In fact, that's probably equally as common. But there's a pacing to it, and it's always light comedy. It's just always light comedy. And that's how all TV is. That's how all anime is. That's how all... I don't know. It, it, it's weirdly not how books are, though. Like, that's, it, for some reason, with books, we're okay with not having light comedy all the time. Most books aren't actually light comedy. Most books are, uh, and I think that's because in a book, you have to spend time doing everything. So you, you can't just, uh, you, you don't have to focus on keeping your audience waiting for the next joke because you can take your time and spend time, like, describing an environment or a smell. You actually don't have a choice but to do that. So that takes the place of, like, aimless humor that is just there to fill, fill airtime. You, you actually have time that needs to be filled by imagery and sensation and emotional description and, you know, all that sort of stuff that a good book has. Uh, and you don't, because it's not just dialogue, but the internet also defaults to that. YouTube, to, from YouTube to even 4chan, everyone, everyone on the internet is not trying to make a, like the the average person on the internet is maybe once in a while trying to make a, a mind-blowing philosophical point. But most of the stuff people do on the internet is, I'm going to write a 4chan post that will be slightly funny. That's it. That's all they're trying to do is I can impress this person by making them laugh. Or I find this funny, so I'll post it. I, I don't care if anyone else finds it funny, but I find it slightly funny. That's it. It's like, oh, I had a funny little thought. Let me make sure all of humanity has access to it. That's all we've done. That's all we've done for the last, like, 100 years is different people in different walks of life thinking, I had a funny little thought. Let me make sure as many people have access to this as possible. And it's just grown and grown and grown until now everyone can do it. And it's, it's crazy. It's a crazy time. And so that's the default state of humanity, not genius philosophical minds, not scientific technological progress, not not depression and war and famine and hate and killing, nor justice and beauty and truth and peace. None of that. The true nature of humanity is funny little thoughts. 
the true mage nature of humanity is just just light light entertainment. <laughs> Things that make you go, ha, 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 that was kind of funny. And then you move on with your life and you never think about it again. Because no one's ever thinking about that stuff. I'm not going to share with you the joke from SpongeBob that was just funny enough to keep me watching. But I'm, I'm going to share with you the one that stuck in my memory because, it, you know, the, the epic moments, the epic SpongeBob moments. I'm, I'm not going to share with you uh, some random anime joke from Goshusa where the character, oh, haha, <laughs> the, the rabbit thing went on her head and she was like, whoa, that's not, no one cares about that. But I watched it. You watched it. Kept me, kept me going. Kept me, kept me pushing through that fucking show, and I, I even like that show. Strange. That's really human nature. There we go. I've discovered it. All these philosophers trying to figure out what it means to be human. I just have done it. And what it means to be human is to have a little tiny funny thought that is not even that funny, and think all of humanity must see this. Oh yeah, I just woke up, so this might be a retarded idea. <laughs> But, okay, so, people are talking about, like, oh, you know, homebrew DIY medicine. Maybe not people always, maybe just in, in the places I hang out in, people are always talking about it. I don't think people in general are always talking about it. But, you know, like, DIY hormones for trans people and DIY medical treatment for people who can't afford it, you know, like 3D printing prostheses, stuff like that, right? But then also people always saying, oh, you should go to therapy and take care of your mental health. So I'm thinking, what if I, you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> I'm thinking, what if I become a DIY homebrew therapist? Because there's loads of people out there that can't afford therapy, right? But probably would benefit from it. And also therapy is made up of all type of bullshit trying to sell drugs to you, trying to sell uh, SSRIs to anyone who could possibly want them. I intend to sell no SSRIs. What if I, I just become a, a unlicensed therapist? <laughs> what if I become an unlicensed DIY punk therapist? That'd be kind of sick. I can do it. I can, I'm good at it. I'm good at it. If you don't believe me, book a session today. I did have a really good idea for something I was going to say in this video last night before I went to bed. I remember thinking about it and then thinking, oh, I'm too tired to record it now, I'll record it in the morning, and I've forgotten what it is. So instead, we're going to be reading more comments from Giblets. Read Dyer Said I. It's on my plan to read list. It's on my wish list on PNDB. I don't know if I'll ever get down to it because it seems very long and but I might read it someday. It's not a priority, but it, I'll probably get around to it eventually. <clears throat> this is a good comment. I've already read it, as you can see. I've loitered around in Counter-Strike for hundreds of hours. The New York movement is what I think kept me coming back. I tend to stick to surf combat, KZ, surf, and B-hops courses. Air strafing adds depth to the, in most games, menial task of walking from point A to point B. The quirks and jankiness of community-made maps is a part of the appeal, but I can't help but wonder what a polished game built all around airstrafing would be like. Airstrafing and surf bay bear a pretty mean learning curve, so I don't expect this dream game of mine to become popular outside the people who already take a liking to these glitches, to whom have become like intended features. Admittedly, there's the Momentum Mod project, which I've never booted up even once, but looks good in their site. Um, I don't think... Air strafing and surfing is like hard to wrap your head. It's like has a hard learning curve at all. It was very easy for me to figure out. I mean, to get good at it is difficult, but it was easy to like learn at first for me. But then again, some of my friends that can't really figure it out, but I try and get them to surf. So maybe you're right. Yeah, I agree basically with everything you said. Um, I, I that's why I would never play Valorant. Because, like, when Valorant first came out, people asked me, like, because everyone knows I play a shit ton of CSGO. Everyone asked, people started asking me, oh, are you going to switch to Valorant? No. Valorant doesn't have community-made maps. It doesn't have B-helping. Like, just no. Uh, BSPWM pro tip. Here, to resize the closing window, you could just press the super key and press the right mouse click. Oh, okay, let's try it. Let's open the terminal. Okay, so super key. So, I mean, I have to... Oh, well, I can drag it. 
with super. Oh, yeah. If I super click, I can drag it. And then, can I? Yeah, okay. I figured it out. It's a bit bit buggy. <laughs> okay, that's way better than doing it with key, key points. <laughs> yeah. So, super left click to drag it around, super right click to resize. Okay. Sick. Thank you for your good comment, Avery Senso. I think that's all the comments. During the early parts of the Industrial Revolution and capitalism, um, production in factories wasn't actually that much more efficient or effective uh, over production in cottage industries. Um, the, they basically had access to the same technology. The only reason to work in a factory is because all of that surplus would be owned by one capitalist, and so or one group of capitalists, you know. And therefore, that was the motivation to get people working in factories as much as possible because rather than many many different people working separately now they would all be all of their produce all of the product of their labor would be owned by one person basically by one capitalist or a group of capitalists um and so but no one actually no one wanted to do this because remember the, the situation in factories was much worse than the situation in cottage industries for for workers, right? Like no no one really wanted to move to fact as much as that I've seen some terrible fucking arguments from, from conservatives where they say like, Oh, everyone just willingly moved uh, into these horrible factory conditions where they were working insanely long hours for insanely low pay with insane living conditions where they were crammed in to these rapidly built dangerous mass housing pods of the earliest Victorian mass housing like and dirty conditions child labor all of this shit right oh but they did it willingly because farming was just that bad farming is not as bad as like do you know how bad it was firstly they had to invent police because people started striking police didn't exist before the industrial revolution uh they were invented because people started striking uh and refusing to work because it was just that shit no one had really done that before. People had done tax strikes for their feudal lords before, but you needed to work to eat if you were working on your own farm. You need, you know, and also a lot of times in cottage industries in a small community, you would be working to simply provide material goods to people within your own community. So it's like, there's no point if I stop making t-shirts in my little village in North England or whatever, because the only people I'm hurting are my friends in the village and the other, my family and whatever. But if you're producing T-shirts for a capitalist, suddenly you have a bunch of power. Anyway, so that's the first thing, is they had to invent police because they tried to shoot in them and that didn't work. That just made them angrier. Uh, and secondly, they literally had to implement laws to stop people, to, to like force people out of their independent labor. For example, they had laws about how many looms you could have in a single house. You, They literally would bust down your door like a fucking modern drug bust. It, oh, you've got one too many looms in your house. Sorry, we're going to have to arrest you, right? Because they they only wanted capitalists to be able to have access to these sorts of means of production. It was literally a psyop, a mass fucking program that exploited people. It was not a willing fucking shift from, oh, feudalism was so bad that even though capitalism was so bad, it was better than feudalism and everyone in the past had it way worse than us and we live like kings. No, that's fucking bullshit. Is the internet a net good or bad, right? I think there are definitely many people who see the internet as a net bad. Um, whereas I, coming from my sort of background interest in extreme I don't know if extreme is the right word, but I, I went through a phase for a long time, a few years, where I was incredibly into cyberpunk as a media genre. You can see in the early videos of my channel sort of the last dregs of this, right? Even in Denver, you can see me, me sort of commenting on this. I was really into cyberpunk. And because of this, I always saw the internet as like the best thing that humanity has ever invented. It's like amazing. And even though um, I'm more cynical about the internet these days, I still believe that the internet is not a bad thing. It's a, it's a tool that has extremely good potential. For example, um, I've made some of the deepest and most, um, 
re re rewarding uh, friendships of my entire life over the internet. Uh, my internet friends are incredibly great for my mental health, my well-being. For every, I love, I, like, I love them. They're great people. It's great, you know. These are people I would never have met. They live in different countries, hundreds of miles away. There's no way I would ever have known them. I've, I've made great relationships and friendships over the internet. And the other thing is knowledge. Um, for example, right now I'm watching some videos about economics, right? This is YouTube videos from just some guy who has a PhD in economics who's just freely sharing his information that he has in this subject he's knowledgeable about. This is stuff that an average person before the internet who didn't have a particular interest in economics would never have learned. And I think that's one of the things that's most powerful about the internet is that you can turn a passing interest into genuine knowledge. So, like, I don't really care that much about economics. I am definitely not going to ever consider doing an economics degree, right? That shit is fucking boring to me. But if I wake up one day and I'm like, hmm, I want to learn a bit about economics, I can just do it. And then I never have to do it again. Or I can just do Or I could learn, I could get really interested in it. The, the idea that you can just have a passing interest in something and then get genuinely valuable information if you're skilled enough to know how to filter out the, all the noise, uh, which is, you know, a problem that didn't exist before the internet, really. It did to an extent, but not to the same extent it does now, that there is too much information, and the skill really comes in knowing how to filter out the noise and select reliable resources. But as someone who I consider myself a pretty well-experienced internet user, uh, that's not too much of a problem for me, um, although it sometimes is frustrating. But the fact that I can just have a vague passing interest in, in economics and get really high quality education for free at any time on the internet is just an incredible, incredible resource. And I think that can't be understated or, or you know, it could be any information that I wanted, not necessarily economics. It's just what's happening right now, what's made me think about this. However, the internet is not just a net positive. Um, I have to admit it, and I've said it before in a semi-joking way, but I will say it again in a true way that I'm addicted to YouTube. I am, I, I have a, more of an addiction to YouTube than I do to nicotine. It impacts my life more negatively. It's, it's honestly bad. I just spend days doing nothing but watching fucking YouTube videos, and it's, there are reasons for it. And I, I do try and curtail it into a, a useful thing. I try and, and, as much as I can, prune my YouTube subscriptions so that I only subscribe to people who make quality content. I'm not just watching shit drivel. Like, I try my best to keep it so that I'm watching stuff that is actually educational or artistic in some way. Um, has some thing that I perceive as value. Uh, you know, not just... Hey guys, in this video, but don't forget to like and subscribe. Anyway, like I try and avoid those as much as possible. I try and subscribe to smaller channels, stuff like that. But, you know, there are still a lot of videos I've watched that are just trash, drivel, sludge. And uh, I just watch them all day and it's bad. It's really bad. Just waste my days doing that instead of doing anything productive. It's to the point where I consider playing video games to be good like like a, a good use like a great use of my time like when i play a video game i feel like i'm being productive because at least it's active consumption not just passively watching youtube videos at least i actually have to think about what i'm doing and at least i have to actually participate in something rather than just mindlessly watching youtube and i again i try my best to to make it so that the youtube videos that i watch and i'm subscribed to are not mindless they are at least make you think about things a little bit, either the information or the artistic presentation. But uh, the problem is when you need to, enough YouTube content to sustain the addiction, where you want to be able to watch all day with nothing else, you there just isn't physically enough of that content that I find interesting or I'm aware of. You know, I'm sure that it does exist, but it's it's like, again, signal to noise. There is so much noise on YouTube that it's harder to find the stuff that's actually interesting you might not stumble up upon it until some random time you might never and uh why was i bringing this up i forgot <laughs>
um, yeah. So I think that's a problem. Uh, I'm not sure what to do about it. But, oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I knew I was going to say something else. So one of the reasons I, I end up doing this, that I end up with this addiction, is because of, as many of you may know, I have bipolar. So sometimes I'm just very depressed for long stretches of time. And my depression comes with a lot of brain fog, where it's just hard to focus on things and do things, you know? Um, hard to think straight and think about complicated, like I just can't physically do it. It's it's a, it's a not something I can control, really. And uh, I also have a lot of anxiety and other problems with stuff that is involved going outside and, you know, social interaction and stuff like that. I find it hard to keep track of friendships and stuff. Like, I physically, I don't think I'm capable of keeping track of more than maybe five friendships at a time, and that's max. Um, I, I really... It's it's just a bit much for me. It's too stressed, too overstimulating, um, and so that puts a bunch of possible activities out the window uh, that I could be doing. Of course, I do spend a lot of time actually doing very productive stuff. Like I work on YouTube. I mean, not YouTube, music. Uh, very hard. Like, well, not very hard. That's not the right. That's not what I meant to say. But like, I do spend a lot of time making music and listening to music, which I consider a part of my work. Just like how, if you want to be a good writer, you have to read a lot. If you want to be a good musician, you have to listen to as much and as varied music as you possibly can. I think that's a problem with a lot of musicians these days. Is they only listen to one genre, or they only listen to, um, they either only listen to old music or only listen to new music. You got to do that. You, you you can't do that. You're just going to end up in a rut. Um, so I spend a lot of time studying uh, music and creating music and stuff like that, which I think is positive, and I, I consider that to be a good use of my time. Um, even when I'm depressed, I can still make music and I can still listen to music, which is good. But when I'm depressed, I can't read, for example. I can't focus on a book for a long stretch of time. I can't read nonfiction, definitely not. I can't. There's no way I could read fucking capitalist realism. I know why that's shot into my head, but you know what I mean. I, I can't really do much like that. Um, so I, the only thing I can really do, I have the motivation to do, I can't even watch anime when I'm really depressed because reading subs is too much like to focus on. Um, and so I just end up watching YouTube because it's really the only thing I can do. Or, I mean, very rarely I will end up watching a TV show, but I really don't watch that much TV. I, I, I mostly find TV to be kind of boring. Um, so I don't know what to do about it, really. Like... I I think I need an, an an extra hobby maybe other than just watching YouTube. Um, I'm not sure what that extra hobby something like an extra hobby that I can do. It's this is the problem, right? Because it needs to be an extra hobby I can do that takes very low effort on my part, but is also involved like enough involved enough that I it's not like uh it takes up my whole mental capacity basically like I, I have to focus fully on it so it can't be like cardistry for example because cardistry is just something i do with my hands i don't have to, i don't think about it there's no real conscious thought it's more of just a stim type of thing or um i don't know knitting like that's a nice hobby to have but it's really just a repetitive action and if i if i do that like you can't just just do that you could but mostly you you would end up doing that while watching YouTube or something. Um, but it also can't be too complex and involved, otherwise when I'm depressed I'll just say I just won't have the motivation or capacity to do it. So I honestly don't know what to do with this this problem. Uh if you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments. Uh uh there I was having fun writing my Linux machine. That was that felt good. Because it was like I was actually learning about how Linux works. I was learning about stuff like that. But I don't think there's no way. There's absolutely no way I would have the patience, motivation, or capacity to do that when I'm in a depressive episode. Um, that That's just never going to fucking happen. Uh, I really, yeah, I, I kind of, I'm not sure. I, I want to sort of break out of the addiction cycle. Uh, but I really just haven't found anything that fulfills the same material need that I have for YouTube where, where I don't know what what could I do like 
they have plenty of stuff to do, but the problem with most of it either is too much effort or too little effort. YouTube is the perfect middle ground where you it, it's it's entertaining and um, interesting enough to keep your brain occupied so you don't get bored or end up, um, you know, <clears throat> doing other, like, thinking bad thoughts or whatever. You don't end up in that sort of situation. But it's also not involved or complicated so that I can do it even when I have no motivation to get out of bed or eat or do anything. Um, like nothing, I I can't really think of anything else that fulfills that need that I have. Um, yeah. Well, I was thinking of changing my wallpaper. I do like my current wallpaper, but I think the colors are a bit bold and I'd like something a bit more calming and sort of chill, even though I do, I do really like this image. So maybe I'll keep it, but, uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking, maybe I'll change my wallpaper, I'll go look for some inspiration. So the first place I go for inspiration is, of course, the Lane Chan desktop thread, right? Yeah, you get some interesting things, you know, people on Lane Chan, they have interesting rices. This is like a, a CDE-inspired thing, I guess, or like retro-inspired. Got some nice wallpapers here, lots of interesting stuff. You know, it's the Lane Chan desktop thread, it is what it is. And previously, I had posted my desktop here. Uh, right here, as you can see, and someone, I, I so I got to this thread, and I'm like, oh, someone, uh, someone you'd me, no, and they said, no, thank you, is that you? Do you see that? No, thank you, is that you? Someone recognized me on Lane Chan. So whoever you are, like the only places I've shown my desktop is I posted on Twitter once, and I've shown it on here. So there's a good possibility that this this is a Lane on who's watching my videos. So whoever you are, Lane on, shout out to you. Fucking weird being recognized in the wild. Um, but yeah, that's that's a bit surreal. Anyway, let's go back to looking. Well, this looks interesting. That's a nice color scheme. I wouldn't use it myself, but that's kind of nice. Um, anyway, yeah, it's probably illegal for me to do. Uh, currently have imagery and appropriate the basis from one direction. So let's break that this down. guy so plays bass for one direction. Um, this telling me to think about what I post on Twitter and you YouTube. Guys are at. If you post something now, um, you might regret it. Later. Really? And just have a think about that. Wow. Think about what that means. I'm wow, I didn't know that. Amazing. Really Yesterday, I watched a video by a channel called The Modern Rogue. I don't even really like the channel anymore, but I've been following Brian Bushwood, the one of the hosts of the show, for like since I was young, and so I basically just invested because I have just, you know, fit the personality of him and his friend. Anyway, um, so I was watching their video, and they made a video where they just talked about some of the interesting ways that game designers, uh, uh, game developers have, like, put anti-piracy measures in their games, like, uh, well, for example, Earthbound, if you pirate Earthbound and it detects it, um, the game will, like, spawn way more enemies it'll still be beatable but it'll be very very difficult and then when you finally get to the final boss um the game will like crash and delete all your saves uh if you pirate it like stuff like that basically um and uh, these like they literally say in the video that they back in the day when they were playing on like early 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 pc games like uh i don't know dragon quest or whatever that they would like pirate floppy disks and stuff like that wasn't that uncommon. But in the comments on the video, you see like a billion people who are like, uh, actually piracy is a good thing. Um, actually piracy is a morally correct thing. And like, it's so fucking weird to me how these people are. Because obviously piracy is a good thing. Like I agree with this, right? But, but I very, very much agree with this. I don't think copyright should even exist. Uh, I I probably agree with it in the most radical way possible, but their arguments are so shit because the only arguments they can give is to parrot things. This is like the the law of the internet, right? The the only way that an argument like that survives on the internet is if it can be explained in a couple of sentences in a t Twitter post or something or a YouTube comment. So it can be explained very quickly. So it can't be a complicated concept, right? Uh, but it also has to like. Uh, it's basically Reddit, right? It has to be something that will get upvotes on Reddit because any argument pro-piracy that is, like, too radical 
will will never spread to enough people to parrot it. So one of the ones you see all the time is uh, actually piracy is really good for games conservation and media conservation. Uh, so anti-piracy measures are actually evil because um, you know we we, 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 we have uh, we have to conserve like Bo. I know you're not a fucking games conservationist. Just admit to everyone that you pirate it because you want to have it for free. That's fine. That's completely fine. It's copying bits. It's copying ones and zeros from someone else's computer. It's not stealing because it's copying. Like, that's the most... There's no odd counter-argument to that. There is zero counter-argument to that. Um, like, you don't have to go out of your way to say, like, oh... It's all really good for games conservation. Bo, you're not... Like, I know you're not conserving shit. You're not the Internet Archive. Like, sure, that is an a important thing. But, like, that's a shitty argument. What, you don't care about that. One of the things I like about uh, Grime that I have realized I was lacking in American hip-hop music is the rhythms. There's like way more interesting rhythms. I think there's a few reasons for this. Firstly, is the Afro-Caribbean influence. So you get these, like for example, the the Slave beat, the like that's kind of, that's like there in grime or the like you get stuff like that. You just get weird fucking rhythms, like loaded rhythms. Uh, and that's partly because of the African influence and stuff, but it's also uh, partly because of the uh, function of the music, right? So hip, American hip-hop music is not inferior because it doesn't have those weird rhythms. It generally follows a very simple, you know, kick, snare on the backbeat type of, type of rhythm. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and the reason for that is that it's not really meant to be danced to, you know? Like, the, there's no reason that the, the point of the beat is really just to support the lyrics and uh, the, the instrumental. You, you can sort of groove to it, but uh, it doesn't need to have the, this, like, l l complex groove that you're supposed to, like, dance to, because, like, if you think of, like, boom-bap music, it's not really meant for that. If you think of, like, modern trap music, it's not really meant for that. But there are certain subgenres that are meant to be danced to, like, for example, bop or uh, footwork, and in those genres, you do find weird fucking rhythms. And some of the more experimental rap has weirder rhythms as well but it, as a general rule of thumb the rhythms are quite simple whereas grime comes from dance music comes from uh garage and the club scene right uh and so the 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 rhythms the weird rhythms are like built into it they're sort of interesting danceable rhythms uh and I, yeah it's just really interesting to listen to like it's a uh, keeps your ears interested it keeps your if you're really used to solid like Four on the floor, not four on the floor, but like like trap, like the you know, like the trap thing. Like give grime and go, because you get all type of fucking weird shits, and it's it's really keeps your ears interested, you know. Fuck, bro! I just it's not even a difficult move. literally easy I don't know why I found that so hard to do it's literally super simple look I just did it twice in a row good enough. I'm fucking saving glitch course less weird core playlist another one with half a million fucking views okay what have we got we got we got we got this fucking Nowhere to run Stegosaurus Rex. What is this? I I tried to listen. It's like a synth pop. It's basically just like a synth pop, like a slightly abstract synth pop song. This is the weirdest song on the whole fucking playlist. The only one that actually kind of fits the title. This is just a suicide song. This is just like a fucking um drum bass, like a, a break core, like drum bass suicide song. This is like a uh like a hyper pop song basically. I think if I remember correctly. Yeah, pretty much. Oh yeah, the, 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 it's just I promise that it's just hundred gigs, hundred gigs. Parker, Parker, what is this? So weird. What are these? It's just a fucking like just a normal ass fucking hardcore song. Like I think it's this one. No, this, this is just a drum and bass song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, it's literally not even a weird drum and bass song. It's just a normal like liquid drum and bass song. That's literally all. It's nothing weird about it at all. 
I'm mad. I'm fucking mad. None of this is weird. None of this is weird. This is this one's good. This is a good one, right? It's actually weird electronic, like it's weird dreamlike electronic music that sounds like the internet. Um, it sounds and it, it's like experimental, genuinely weird fucking synths, dreamlike, hypnagogic type shit. Something you would find in like, you know, like one of these Anna cartoons things or like. You know, some of them might be... In, it's actually good, basically, is what I'm trying to say. This is pretty much... I have, I listened to the first three tracks, and I was instantly like, oh, look, it's not fucking Parker. It's not Osquin or whatever this motherfucker's name is now. It's like... It sounds like old... Kind of like a weird, abstract version of, like, old video game PC music... PC game uh, soundtracks, like, from, from, like, the early 2000s, but, like, mixed with, like, maybe some, like you know, a little more dreamy and then with some, like, modern production type shit in there as well. That's what I'm talking about, motherfucker. That's what I'm talking about. This is what I'm all about. This is what I'm all about. None of your fucking... Oh, it's it's so Osquin. It's Osquin. It's so fucking... Oh, I put a hundred gigs in it. Isn't this so weird, cool? Isn't this so internet cool? Shut the fuck up, bitch. I didn't really notice, but I think this video is, like, five hours long. <laughs> I think I've been recording way too much, way too long. Oh, well. People like long videos, right? This is the first time I've been outside. And not just to go to my local shop. So this is the first time I'm going to be going on a bus and going beyond the shop to buy alcohol in... I'm pretty sure at least six months. At least. Could be more. I can't remember another time more recently than that that I've done this. Well, I remember, I think, the last time I went out properly. But this will be the first time in a very long time that I've been outside properly not just to go to the shop and buy alcohol This is the first time I've been on the tube since the pandemic to myself. I'm a bit nuts. <laughs> Going outside, generally regarded as a bad idea. Avoid at all costs. Uh, it's cold out there, fucking freezing. One thing I noticed, when you've been wearing sweatpants for months, jeans are very uncomfortable. Not good. Um... You have to walk to places instead of everything just being right next to you. It's just all around a bad idea. Uh, but I did get myself a little treat. Some Lefroig, uh single malt scotch whiskey. Isla scotch, so that means it should be peaty, I believe. Never had Lefroig before. Very excited to try it. Um, let's open this baby up. Oh man, that smells amazing. Yeah, nice and smoky, peaty. I'm definitely getting the island notes. Yeah, okay, let's pour myself a glass. Just a little bit. It's still a bit early, so I don't want to drink too much. Oh, it's got a nice color to it. I, I barely want to drink. I just, I just want to taste it. I don't, I don't want to drink. It's a fancy whiskey. Cost me. 40 quid this bottle did 40 fucking quid hopefully it's worth it i mean it it's going to be worth it from the smell mm. it's got a nice color let's taste it ooh bit grassy i would say that's the peat of course oh that's really nice very smooth. What percentage is this? 40 horsepower. 
That is really nice whiskey. The aftertaste, it's not overpowering at all. Like, it's not unpleasant. It's very pleasant, in fact. Coats your mouth. Hmm. Warming, as is good on a winter's day. Let's have another sip, shall we? Hmm. It's very nice. It's got like, like a grass grass vibe to it, like a moss vibe to it, uh, which is really nice. Um, my my Lagavulin never never has that. Never had that. I mean, that's the only other PT whiskey I've had, so that's why I'm comparing it to. Um, but yeah, this is definitely a bit more grassy, a bit more light. Like it doesn't feel as heavy as Lagavulin. Um. Generally, really good. Definitely getting this again. Delicious. Anyway, I think this is going to be the end of the video. Uh, good place to end it. Um, if you're watching this near when it comes out, then Valentine's Day, I'm dropping a new single. Go check that out. And uh, that's it, really. I'm, I'll probably make more videos like this. I, I guess I'll edit this right now.